I'm going to read for your hearing and for everyone's hearing utter this EAB that everybody <laughs> says it's bunk, all right, by these most learned people in the Cayman Islands. It is flawed assumption that healthy reefs comprise of 100% live coral tissue. On average, reefs across the region comprise of less than 10% live hard coral. Cayman's reef have been assessed using various methods as having an average life cover is an indicator that the overall health of those reefs and the metrics should not be taken to mean that only 25 to 30 percent of the reef is alive. The, the EIA results indicate that the reef habitats in the Georgetown Harbor reefs show live hard cover that is between 10 and 30 percent, which is phenomenal in any capacity. And it has staghorn and elk horn, which is critically endangered. To that end, doctor, could you replant staghorn and Absolutely. elk horn? Absolutely. And, you know, regretfully, staghorn and elk horn were the first two species of corals to ever go on the endangered species list. And this happened about over 10 years ago. And really, worldwide, we've lost about half the world's corals. And there were reefs that were 25 to 50 percent live coral cover. They were phenomenal yeah. and came on as one of the premier ones that even though a lot of other places are down to 7 and 10 percent live coral, came on has 10 to 15 percent. So they're doing much better as they have done in the past when they had 25 to 50 and other people had 15 to 20. And in fact, I came here in 1975 as a senior in college to try and do a survey of the corals of Cayman and the seagrasses and the soft corals. And I fell in love with this island. And I remember when there was... We have that effect in many. I remember, <laughs> I remember when uh, I could show people elk horn and stag horn. In fact, I used to say that some places going inshore, I had to swim over the top of stag horn corals to find a cool brain coral or from the outer reef side it was very difficult to get over the outer reef with a boat because there was so much elk horn coral that it was very difficult to not make it without getting your chest all scraped up and yeah. now i have to show people where an elk horn is the side, and i did it? see a couple right where the birthing area is and those can be the two easiest species to actually reproduce by the thousands by the thousands. And, and I, not the thousands, by the millions. In fact, wow. a statement that I like to make, and people uh, uh, wonder why I, I say plant a million corals, is because I could start, or anybody could start, with just a 400 little pieces of a staghorn or an elk horn coral. And within six months, have 20,000. And within six months after that, have one million corals. And so literally, with enough pressure and enough enough funding and support and willingness of volunteers to plant, we could take elk horn and staghorn corals off the endangered species list in the island of Grand Cayman. Wouldn't that be the coral capital of the Caribbean? We could do this in many other places. I would love to see Cayman be, they're stronger now in, in their corals, but why not be back the way it used to be? We can do it now with the other species. There's a number of other species of the massive corals, mm -hmm. the boulder corals, the brain corals. They yeah. really make that reef structure that you see in You're there. You're correct, yeah. The little elk staghorns are, are like, sometimes they're they decorative. say. decorative. Yeah, they're like a small plant in a big forest. But the forest is made by the massives. Um, I was just, <laughs> happened to be one of the people that said there's a new technology out there now that takes the massive corals and can make them as fast as the elk horn and the staghorn corals now. The, the team I was working with were phenomenal, and they said, wow, we have to bring this to Cayman, because, you know, um, this would be a wonderful technology. So I was impressed by just the ability of them saying, we don't want to, you know, damage corals. We know that where we're going to build this extensive dock is going to take some out, and we're hiring a group that's going to transplant, and that's a fairly new um, technology, 10 or 15 years now. But the new technology of actually restoring and growing not just the staghorn and elk horn, but the big massives, is now a new technology. And they jumped onto the bandwagon and said, let's try this here. This is what could really help this island. So um, a 
couple of things. I've, I've gotten some calls and some emails of people saying, well, because I want to try and help out, because I want to try and grow some corals, now I'm advocating killing corals. And that's further from the truth than could ever be. I know that the people of Cayman on this referendum are going to have to make the decision of what they want. Do they want cruise ships or not cruise ships? Do you want to keep anchoring out on the, the, the reef between the outer reef now where it is and, and the drop-off zone? Um, I would say that uh, as an environmentalist, you got to stop <coughs> anchoring out there. you got to start tying up to something fixed. I know the, the rationale for dropping people off in safety is another factor, but environmentally, we got to stop dropping those anchors. and we got to have less anchoring points, more fixed points. It's going to take four big ships out of the anchoring area and hopefully only a few uh, global positionings uh, for the overflow pass four. I think this is a win for this area. If there's a better spot to put this that, you know, impacts moving less corals, I think everybody would be up for the idea. A anything we can do to make it better is what I've heard from these engineers and these people from this company. So I'm impressed. So you give a guarantee that you can plant a million corals and you can, you can make in, just in the Cayman Islands alone, Michael, this would be a big win for you and your shareholders as well. Because more than likely, you know, you're, you're probably going to have an uh, uphill battle to, to, to try to convince a lot of people that this project is not there. Environment is one aspect of it. The clarity of the water and so forth, the AAB says that it's not going to be that way forever. It's going to continue having the sediment in there. Got to ask you, Michael, you heard that. Do, good doctor, would you give a guarantee then? G would, would you give a guarantee I, that we will take with this project, given where we are and how we're going to be doing it? You said it earlier, but I would like it to be clarified, not just in, in just uh, an emotive kind of a spiel. Would you say that this project, if funded by this particular group, which could be an integral part of where Cayman negotiates the government and so forth with Michael, and, and Carnival going forward, that you can take those two corals off the endangered list and have Cayman be that one spot in the world that people can say, let's go back and snorkel and scuba dive in the Cayman Islands. Woody, I can't guarantee anything that I'm even going to be alive for my next breath in a minute. But I don't know what the rest of the world's going to do because they're all exhaling, they're all driving cars, they're all burning fossil fuels what will happen in 20 years or 50 years from now. And in fact, I think we have to watch things like the environment of the corals in Cayman to show the rest of the world that we've got too many people on this planet. We've got too many uses of resources. And people, I think, are coming to Cayman because it has still some of that beauty. That's the point. And so... You just hit the nail on the head, and that's why a lot of people are emotional about this. But, but it's worldwide. If, if you say, I, we don't want any people here to see how beautiful our place is, no, we'll there'll still be that. people burning fuel the rest of the planet. Yeah, especially and the I cruise think, lines, huh? And I think we so can... So he needs to go LNG. We well, are going LNG, by the Oliver. way. In fact, all of our new ships, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Icon, are all LNG. I, I read it, in your, I read <laughs> yeah. it in, your, in your report, yes. That's why I said it. Poke Thank at you. you. <laughs> so all of us have to do our parts to make sure that what we all hope will happen in the future. I can't guarantee it because I can't guarantee what what 8 billion people on this planet are going to do. But I know... About, I'm not talking about 8 billion But I know people. that... See, by 2020, by 20, 2050, according to the world population, we'll have 10 billion people, which is crazy, I know. And so we, we, we have, to, to Michael's point, to everyone's point, the government is already rating this island for 100,000 population living here. That's not your 2.5 million that's going to be coming in. So we need to ready ourselves for that. The point is, is that we are asking you because we keep hearing that yes we believe we can do it but if it doesn't happen where does that leave us what if the coral does not take good doctor and all of your suppositions you know that's a good there. question it's all good question because this is very new technology and we've only really been doing this for about five years and in fact people around the world that have been doing coral restoration have only been working with that very fast growing branching corals like a staghorn it's only very recently that we've been able to grow all the species. The good news is, is that it's very similar to um, forest, reforestation. We learned 
hundreds of years ago that we can replant trees. The first person that probably planted a tree, they said, probably said, can you guarantee that you can regrow this forest? Probably not. Same thing with mangroves, the same thing with, with dune grasses, marsh grasses, etc. We knew in the past 30 years from uh, starting that, that it was unknown what the future can do. But there are hundreds of natural grass and wetland and mangrove nurseries that are successfully planting millions, if not billions, of trees now. Uh, we can do that soon with the underwater forests. Um, it's going to take probably 20 years for this to happen. I'm going on the premise that I'm coming here to Cayman with or without a port. No matter what happens with the change, I'm going to be here trying to grow more corals. I have to say that with an economy and support by a lot of different people, it can probably go faster with, with support for people like tourists that will want to see this wonderful new technology, maybe even in an educational thing for the schools here as well as for the public. Could you imagine if we could show Cayman uh, 1.8 million people that visit here, what Cayman he is doing? 2.5. 2.5 million yeah. people uh, every year of, of what Cayman is doing to grow 100,000 corals a year and put them back onto the reef. You know how many people are going to say, wow, I dove back in the 60s and 70s on Eden Rock. And This is going to be gone. No, I don't think so. I don't think, I think you're looking at the old EIS position. Well, and, that's and the thing. So we need a new EIA. I think you probably saw in the presentation, there's a new work in progress of trying to make all of those factors that people have brought up. Sedimentation, silk curtains, you're going uh, where further, we're positioned. You're going further south now with the cargo facility um, in that aspect of it. So I'm not, I'm not a doctor in any way whatsoever. I got to ask you my layperson standpoint. Good doctor. Yes. Unlike forests on the land, on terra firma, we can all talk about air quality and so forth, but it is my layperson's understanding that coral are a little bit more sensitive, hence the reason why they're dying. They're sensitive to environmental factors. They, they have bleaching. pH balances in water. Temperatures can vary within 10 feet of a certain area because of whatever ebbs and flows of tides they may be. Am I fair in saying that? You're right on target that All corals right. are the most sensitive, and that's why they're showing so, worldwide the first changes in climate change. And right, and the like sad that. part about it is a person like you may be heartbroken to know that everybody knows as well. The Great Barrier Reef is dying about, a, a, was it a mile a day or something thereabouts that somebody said? But having said that, good doctor, i got to ask you, I am, I'm not a doctor. God created these reef systems, and this is our natural heritage. I have to ask you, why weren't they grown or positioned in a different location where you want them to grow if that's how nature wanted it to happen? And if nature wanted it to happen, why didn't it just happen by osmosis? Just kind of go down the line and it just happened so. That's a great question because most people misunderstood, Stan, actually what even a coral is, or how it reproduces, or why it's in one area and why it's not in another area. Correct. You know that we didn't even know that corals had a sexual reproduction cycle until the mid-1980s? We didn't know how they I reproduced. I thought that was pretty cool. We learned I slept that a holiday hundreds of years ago, <laughs> hundreds of years ago, um, you know, animals, plants, and almost every organism that we know, uh, how it reproduces. And yet we did not know how most of the corals, and most of the corals, unlike the fragile branching corals like staghorn, will break and fragment. That's why it became the easy first coral restoration species, because people would go out with a nursery and just manually break those fragile pieces and make more. The rest of the species are reproduced by sexual reproduction by once a year spawning, putting out these very tiny larvae that move over and only one in a million makes it yep. every maybe 10 to 100 years, which yep. sounds incredible. That's crazy. But it has to be exactly the right position. So we may have another natural spawn in 100 years, but do we want to wait 100 years to try and let Mother Nature come back on its own, just like a forest? No. If we know how to plant a tree, we do it. We know now how to start planting corals. We should be doing it. And... Um, you know, it's, it's probably uh, uh, serendipity that 
maybe some efforts of, of taking this newer technology and now really getting it applied here. There's been a number of great people, organizations, CCMI, uh, a number of uh, scuba places that have learned the staghorn way of, of branching and breaking some and putting it out there, and that, that's great. Uh, what I hope to do, with or without a port referendum of whatever results are, is help came on to grow more corals. Well, I'm looking forward to, to having that staghorn and elkhorn taking off of that list. But still, as everybody says, I can't guarantee anything, and that's a variance. But one thing that we will guarantee, that we will have a parking lot afterwards. But everything else is never a guarantee to it. Those are some of the things that we're talking about, and that's, that's the dichotomy. That is the serious position that we're all in. You will get your port. You will get your parking lot for your big ship, but we don't, cannot get a guarantee. You'll be given a guarantee that there is going to be a physical presence there, but when it comes to you, it's almost like we're a guinea pig to see how this thing is going to happen. You even just said that just now. Well, no, I said, what I said is that this is on top of the other performance and, and uh, the inspections of relocating and trying to do the best right thing. So this is an additional sort of... Uh, add on top, which I think is timely. It happens to be timely for the whole world of what this can take place, and which is why I'm trying to postpone my retirement to make sure people can say we can grow corals everywhere. Why not grow it here in Grand Cayman first? All right. Well, we got CCMI that's going to be coming on very shortly as well um, to talk about it. Um, <laughs> Barry, I, you got to say you got to pull it over there and just at least say you know thank you, Kim, and I'm thank going to be you, back. Kim, you know, Barry, <laughs> just just come back across here. Barry and I have, have agreed Lynn is going to work at a schedule with Barry to have him come back, and we're going to simply talk about the mechanical, technical details with Barry. Barry, um, before you leave, explain to everybody whom you are again, because we're going to tie up. Um, everybody has to go. Uh, we're being pushed out of studios. Michael, has he's a big man. He needs to go and meet with probably the premier or somebody as well. So I'm Barry Loudermilk. Uh, with Orion Marine Group, uh, former Meisner Marine. Uh, it was an acquisition back in the early 2000s. Um, I represent one of the partners, the Burton Airport partners. All right. And so we're going to have Barry back. And, uh, you know, Michael, I just want to say sincerely thank you for coming in. Um, and I just want to say to all of the listening audience, just like last night as well, we got tons of people that participated. I know Lynn will be looking at some of the social media. 137 comments um, this morning, and a lot of emojis as well. So most of them <laughs> ticked off. Friendly, just... happy, smiling faces. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> We're going to play that song for you. I, but uh, and I'm some, happy. somebody, I, I actually want to say. We're, we're paving over par, uh, paradise to create a parking lot. That, that was a request earlier as well. So we're, we're looking at all of those things. But Michael, honestly, I, I have to say thank you very much for being the executive that you are coming in and listening and actually feeling the question in the comments, because frankly, I, this is my homeland and you only fight for something that you love. You see, I grew up in West Bay. I grew up right on the Bay and we had really some dumb politicians to say the least, over the last several decades that has created a mess of our beautiful Seven Mile Beach. Where I grew up, we still own property, thank God. My father was smart 55 years ago to buy it. We still have it at the northern end of Seven Mile Beach. As a child, my friend, I was able to walk that whole entire Seven Mile Beach up to Treasure Island and past, in fact, up to Cocoa Plum. Sometimes when the sea was right, we can get there to Pageant Beach, roughly where the good doctor has cited that some of the car will be going, which is good for that, that new development, by the way. But now we can't traverse it because of stupid decisions. Decisions that have now cost us over 200 yards of South Mile Beach that is not coming back, Barry. No matter what we do, good doctor, I urge you to go and check the Malacan of West Bay. You can go and check it out. It may, it may not take you a long distance going down there, but... Just ask a driver to take you down by Boggy Sands Road. Imagine, the name is called Boggy Sand Road. Typically, we name things after people. So that, that gives you a context where it is. There's no more beach left because of stupid decisions. But we're left holding it. And others walked <coughs> away, sold properties. And this is why it's an emotive <coughs> issue, Michael. 
not only to you as a businessman, because you have an obligation, as you said, for your shareholders. Congratulations on making $1.8 billion over the fiscal year and increasing 4% annually over the last four years. For any CEO, that's a good deal. But for us Cayman Islands, we need to make sure that the decisions that we're going to have is not something that we're going to look on in 20 years and go, when you walk away from it, that we're left holding a bag because we have lost the whole entire plot of where we're at. And I think you understand those issues very, very well. And so because of that, those things are very emotive to people. The good doctor simply said that the most sensitive thing is corals because it just takes the right timing, the right light, so to speak, the right kismet, the right little sparkle to make it all happen. If not, it would have happened already. All of those variables are those that are there, Michael, that why people feel this. And that's why you feel vilified that the big capitalist is coming in. If there's any place that love capitalism, it is the Cayman <laughs> Islands, my friend. I hope you know that. Yeah. Look all around you. Yeah. Look at the cars that we drive. Look at what we do. Yeah. We embrace it. So to that end, it's not really fair sometimes to say we're the big bad wolf that's coming in. They just feel that this is an inequitable deal to the whole extent. And once again, our stupid government <coughs> has not negotiated a best deal for all of us in the minds of most. But to that end, I sincerely thank you for coming in and talking because our government doesn't have the leadership abilities that you have that's willing to come in and talk with the people in this way. They only want, like last night, taking questions written down and, and, and not willing to, to talk to the people. So thank you for showing that leadership. And I look forward to you coming back, seriously. And TJ, if you need to as well, come back because we need to have this discussion all the way through because one thing it is is that you will be guaranteed a port, but we're not guaranteed anything in terms of the environment. And that, gentlemen, I think any one of you will be sensitive to. And that's why there has to be a little bit more protocols, a little bit more comfort to the other end of the equation. My mother always told me, she says, always remember that the bank is not your friend. They have their own ledger sheet and you have yours. You have your ledger sheet, we have ours in the Cayman Islands. Ours are quite unique, which the environment is one of those natural heritage. So, sir, honestly, Thank you very much for coming in, and I look forward to meeting you again and maybe coming back on.